The Sound Tracker, and today I want to talk about cassette tapes and players. Now, if you're exploring the idea of getting a hi-fi unit together on the cheap, a tape deck is actually a great option. They sound good, there's a lot of inexpensive tapes that you can find cheaply for little money, decks themselves are pretty easy to fix, and they offer a wide range of uh, features depending on which ones you buy. And best of all, you get to record your own music! I mean, making a mixtape is a bit of an art form, and while I appreciate the convenience that my computer will offer me in making a playlist, it's just not the same as choosing what music you want to commit to a tape. So let's start out by looking at a tape deck and seeing what the basics have to offer. This deck is a Panasonic RS-363. It's a pretty simple but very usable deck. We've got not one but two tape decks in one unit. That's two with full playback and one with recording capability. Automatic tape type selection, a tape counter for deck A, peak level meters, Dolby noise reduction, an editing speed selector, auto space editing, and a record level slider. What does all of this mean in practice? Well, let's hook it up and find out. To connect the tape deck to a hi-fi stereo, it's a pretty simple deal. Just take a look at the back of the tape player here, and you'll see two RCA jacks. One of these is line in to record sound sources to a tape, and the other one is line out to bring audio from the tape to the receiver. On the back of the receiver down here, there are a whole lot of inputs that can be used if you're just playing a tape. You could plug it into auxiliary, into video. The receiver does not care where you plug it in if you're just listening to a tape, except for phono. That's records only because it has a special preamp specifically for records. If you want to record, though, a lot of hi-fi receivers like this one have what's called a tape audio loop. This passes all of the audio coming into the receiver to the tape deck through the RCA jacks down here. Whether it's from a CD, the radio, the record player, all of it will end up at the record jacks in the tape loop. So, line out from the tape deck, over here, goes to line in on the receiver, which is play down here, there we are. There we go. And amp out on the receiver, goes to line in on the tape deck up here. And there you have it. This is all there is to connecting a tape deck to a hi-fi receiver. So we have a tape deck set up, now we just need some tapes to record and to play. And in general, pretty much any standard cassette will work in any tape deck with no issue. Huge asterisk on that one though, because cassettes have had over their lifespan a lot of different applications, but mostly their use was pretty much just music. Cassettes, as far as most hi-fi players are concerned, though, are a four-track, two-channel system. And say for a second that this drawing is a zoom-in of the recordable tape itself. The recording area on a tape is divided into four tracks, and an electromagnet, called the head, translates sound into a set of magnetic pulses, which then magnetizes the metal particles along the surface of the tape, recording the left and right channels along two of the tracks, which is how it records stereo sound. When one side runs out of tape, turn the cassette over and use the other two tracks to make a complete tape. Say you're not happy with the recording, though. Maybe it was too muffled, or you just decided you didn't want that particular song on the tape anymore. There's another head inside of the machine before the record head, called the erase head, that can erase two of the tracks, which can then be re-recorded onto. The same head that records in most machines is also responsible for playing back what's been recorded. The heads pick up the same magnetic pulses and translate them back into sound. There are some three-head machines for erase, record, and play, but they are usually in high-end cassette decks, and two heads are enough to get the job done. While pretty much any standard hi-fi cassette deck will treat all tapes that same way, tapes themselves also have their own little intricacies, and depending on which kind you use, some sound better than others, and if you're playing studio recorded tape, they're mastered to sound as good as they can, but if you're recording your own, the two main things to take into account are the tape formulation and the noise reduction. Over the years, cassettes have had various little improvements to how they're made, the first of which is the tape formulation. There's four separate kinds here. Type 1, which is called ferric, has a better bass and mid-range reproduction. Type 2, which is called chrome, this one has a much better treble reproduction. Type 3 is ferrochrome, and this is a sort of hybrid between 1 and 2, and that is really supposed to be the best of both worlds here, but it didn't exactly sell well, and as a result they're pretty expensive and hard to find, so I don't have one. Type 4 is metal tape, and this right here is the last and best sounding formulation of tape that exists. 
Fortunately, it's easy to tell which tape is which type at a glance. For recordable tapes, the formulation is always prominently displayed on the tapes and on the cases themselves, but you can also tell by the color of the tape itself. Type 1 tape is a lighter shade of brown than the other two types, but how do you tell the difference between Type 2 and Type 4 at a glance? Well, the answer can be found on the top of these things, at the notches. Recordable tapes have notches along the top, which help some tape players, like ours, identify which type of tape is being used for recording. Some tape formulations require a little more power to record the signal to the tape properly, so the deck needs to know which type of tape it has inside. Type 1 has pretty well no notches at all, except for just the, uh, the regular record tab notches. Type 2 has an extra spacing for these notches, and Type 4 has notches out of here. The other general improvement in tape is noise reduction, the most common of which is Dolby noise reduction. Now, each formulation of tape has different levels of hiss. This is a sound that happens as a result of imperfections in the magnetic tape passing across the playhead. Now, it's not ordinarily supposed to sound this loud, but I've boosted the volume quite a bit to show you what it sounds like. For home recording, there's three types of Dolby noise reduction. There's Type B, Type C, and Type S. Now, tape players have switches on the front of them to activate Dolby, and depending on the deck that you buy, you'll have none, one, two, or all three of them available to you. Type B is the most common, and will be marked as one of these two particular uh, notations on the deck. I, they, they changed logos after a little while, so... Yeah. But uh, Type C is one that you're going to find on a lot of good decks from the 80s, and Type S you'll find on high-end decks that are a little more fully featured. It's pretty rare, though. I mean, I usually find B and C decks out in the wild, and I have never, ever seen Dolby S in person. Excepting, of course, on this cassette. I have no idea why they chose to put uh, Dolby Type S on it, but uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting one to have. What Dolby does when you record a tape is boost up the high frequencies being recorded onto the tape, so when you play it back with Dolby switched on, it reverses the process and brings the frequencies back down to where they're supposed to be, which helps lower the noise from the tape overall. And now, with noise reduction applied... Noise reduction is pretty instrumental in making tapes sound better, and is pretty much universally applied to studio tapes to make them sound more like this. And if studio tapes can sound that good, can I get a recording to sound that good? Let's set up the deck for recording and see. Now, I am hell-bent on this step because, as a kid, I could never, ever get a tape to sound as good as the studio recorded tape. They either came out too muddy or too saturated or just too dull overall because 10-year-old me wasn't exactly the refined, elegant man you see here today. For this, I'm going to be using an unused Type 1 tape, and you're going to have to give me a minute because there's a certain... Je ne sais quoi about opening a tape that you're going to record onto. I haven't felt that in so long. Was it good for you? <laughs> oh, 
There's a couple of things to note about the tape. First, the bias on here is normal, which means that this is a Type 1 tape. So this will automatically be figured out by the deck here. Now, some decks also have an EQ selector. Normal is Type 120 microseconds. And despite my reading about this a lot, I really don't have a fully good understanding of it yet. Point is, Normal gets set to 120 microseconds for equalization so that the tape can sound its best. This was the first response that I read that gave me any kind of inclination as to what the hell EQing at 120 microseconds means, and I need to do a lot more reading to make sense of this. Alright, so, let's get the tape ready. Oop. Ah, can't forget the ID card. That's always nice to keep. And what I want to do first is wind the tape on a little bit until we see it sticking out from the bottom here much longer than I thought it would. There we go. Perfect. I wind the tape up to the pressure pad here on purpose. Now, I like to start recordings here because this is where the record head starts to contact the tape itself. Now, the tape in question is a Memorex 60, so presumably we're going to have 30 minutes of recording time on each side. And that means fun with math! <laughs> I'm not really going to put you through all that, though. I mean, I've already gone ahead and looked at the songs that I'm going to record and figured out exactly how much time it's going to take. I like to maximize tape space and fit as much music on one cassette as possible, and math is really the only way. As long as your total time is under 30 minutes aside in this case, you're good to go. But that's only one aspect of this, and honestly the easiest one. To set the volume levels for recording, put the tape deck into record pause mode. Start the song playing at the source, which in my case is the computer. And with the tape and record pause, adjust the level at the volume slider. Too much will oversaturate the tape, and too little will make for too weak of a recording. So let's see here. Pro tip, I like to start the song more in the middle when I'm setting recording levels because that's where it's going to be the loudest. If the song opens quietly and it's not accounted for, you stand a good chance of oversaturating the tape, and it does not sound good. So back on setting the meters for recording, you want to aim for the meters to peak right about here. Every cassette deck has a way of telling you where to set the noise reduction peaks. The Dolby symbol is right here, so when the music plays, I want to adjust the meters to just kind of light up on it. Side note, if you're doing something like copying a CD to a tape, you only have to do this one time, preferably with the loudest song on the disc. If you're doing this from a ton of different songs, each of them with a different sound source, you have to set the levels every time like I just showed you, for every song. Each song will have a different volume overall if they're from different sources, and it needs to be accounted for. Something else that's important to bring up, when you're done recording one song, don't just go for the stop button, because then you'll have to, in the first case, reset all this again. But in the other case, it makes this weird clicking sound that happens in between songs, because every time record happens, the electromagnet kind of hits the, the tape again. Well, with that in mind, let's record some NSP. It's 
crazy I order my grandma Stacy's and sit down with her for biscuits and have a nice chat. Fuck yeah! How to talk to women. Give me a delicious groove. This is what I tell them. I'm gonna take my thing, diddly out and slam it in your thumb. Let's kill ten guys tonight. You know what? First day, let's pump the brakes on the murders. Let's kill five guys tonight. I'll take you. Geo, have you seen? Can't you are now? Wishing you and all your family some good and happy health? No. Seduction is like a game of chess. And I'm the queen. Making tapes is absolutely a labor of love, and a well-made tape is super enjoyable to me. Everything that goes into it, choosing songs, finding out how long they are, making decisions based on if you want to strike the songs and replace them because all of your favorites couldn't possibly fit on the tape, taking the time to make sure all the levels are right when you're recording, trying to time everything so that you pause the tape before it starts recording a song you don't actually want on there, writing down the tracks, maybe drawing something on the card to kind of customize it and make it your own. There's a lot of heart that goes into it, and that's really what making a mixtape is all about. Loving a band so much that you took time out of your life to collect their best work. Ninja Sex Party are one of my favorite modern bands, and I'm gonna be enjoying my Ninja Sex tape for a long time. So that's tape, an overview of the format. It's one of my favorite ways to listen to music, and it has been ever since I was a kid. I mean, I've never not had cassettes in my house, and a good tape deck is a great addition to a hi-fi system, not just for listening to your favorite albums, but for saving the songs that meant something to you. And a person's favorite music says a lot about them, and what music you commit to a tape speaks a lot for where you were in your life at the time. So thank you for watching, and if you like this video, you know what to do.